we didn't discuss presentations previously, but much of what previously was said will almost be an introduction to what I'm about to say. Um, so um, I want to begin with two, two things, really. A little bit about sustainable practices and sustainable winemaking practices. And the second, which is really talking about how to design wineries in the future that would have what we believe to be truly sustainable practices. Um, the practices piece is we talk about purity. And so the question is why are you doing things that don't add to purity? Why are you doing things that detract from purity? And we'll come to that one. But the other piece about the purity in the future world is going to be footprints. Okay, so you can talk about sustainability, and you can talk about being transparent, and you talk about accountability, but at some point you actually have to have the footprint. And you have to tell people what it is, and you have to be proud of it and own it, and you have to change it. And it's a it's a, an area of the sustainability world which I believe has been pushed into the corner. And the feature of that that's most important is perhaps carbon. And as you understand, the reason we won't be able to implement things in 30 years is carbon. So touch on those briefly, then we'll talk about how to build a winery that doesn't use the ones of electricity because it's off the power grid. How to build a winery that runs off the water grid so it doesn't use anyone's water. Uh, how to build a winery that uses water 10 times, not water. Um, a winery which captures the carbon ready to be sequestered on a site. So it has zero carbon emission. It has a zero carbon footprint. You with me? And you don't have to go all the way, you just go the road with it. Okay. Um, and the role of that, the critical one, the elephant in the room of the carbon world, is the fermentation release. We'll come back to that later. Um, how to build better buildings so that we don't need lots of energy. So we don't need lots of So better thermally constructed buildings which are actually deliberately designed to maintain conditions for money winemaking but far less resources and energy to do so. Um, how to incorporate that with smart systems and stuff so that it's easy to use. One of the problems in managing energy is predicting demand. One of the biggest problems in the world of winemaking is a thing we call harvest. And being able to work out how to efficiently use energy and water in a harvest is about understanding and predicting and modeling the demand in a rapidly changing few weeks. So the mathematics and the modeling and the integration and the systems is all tied back to the harvest and fermentations and the order in which things are happening. And we could do that. So let's go forward. So to first piece, with sustainable practices, um, I pulled up oh, this slide I'll show in a minute. It was actually a presentation to the OIV in San Francisco in 1995. And you probably understand it's gone nowhere. But uh, I bring it up again because it essentially says what we want to have is a theme of uh, non-residue winemaking. Okay? We actually want to do things to wine to get an effect, but we don't want stuff in the wine having done so. And that's a mine warp from current conditions. One of the problems we typically do is we have a solution that we dump things into tanks to achieve an objective. And then what we do is we take the wine out, maybe got rid of the sediment and stuff, we transfer it to another tank, and we go back and wash the first tank. So it's pretty hard to talk about bentonite farming and settling and racking if it's a water problem. And adding the bentonite to get the treatment to do the tank transfer to make it stable for bottling, actually all you did was dirty another tank and have to go back and wash the first one. So the alternative to that is what we call out of tank treatments. Where once you've got wine in the tank, you actually don't want to lose it out. You don't want to have five tank transfers. You want to do everything you want to do with getting that tank. And that requires what we call out of tank treatments. The other part of that cleaning chemistry is if we did it very well and we captured it, and if we started with very clean water, we could actually filter and recover much of that water and use it in the next tank, rather than washing a tank and going down the drain and asking for more water and washing it again and doing things which require lots of tank transfers. Um, you can see the combination of not transferring tanks and the technologies that will let you do that. 
combined with the increase in interest in water savings and the multiple use of water. The same thing. So then green clean chemistry says it's not using phosphates in discharge, not making nitrates in waste water ponds, not having chlorine, not using chlorine dioxide, not increasing ozone, and being able to kill bugs and have a sanitary condition with a combination of hot water and peroxide, or ambient and peroxide, or hot water, that you would knowingly be able to kill bugs without the chemistry. So this is a slide, and it's from should have said, but it doesn't matter. So right now we do bentonite additions. We throw in clays. They have ion exchange capacity. The problem is they swell. They don't settle very well. There's a lot of wine loss, a bit of oxidation pick up on a transfer, and we dump it in the landfill. And so the alternative would be, where's the column of material which is able to absorb the same proteins we're interested in, able to be bounded outside the tank, able to treat a fraction of the wine in the tank, uh, be able to be regenerated and contained and used again and again and again and again, but not have to transfer the wine out of the tank from having done a bit more fun and achieve the same objective much more efficiently. There's a material called macro prep that we worked on in the 90s. There's an ultimate irony here that we was a scholar from Portugal that was sent to Davis on an OAB scholarship <coughs> to work on macro prep, again, more than 25 years ago. And that's commercial. It's been available. It's used in the farm industry. I don't know anyone on the wine street yet that's using it, except ourselves. People in Japan have built immobilized tannin columns, which would do the same kind of protein absorption. It wouldn't have the benzene, wouldn't have the leaves, wouldn't have the tank transfer, wouldn't have the tank washing. OK, so where is the adoption of these? They're going to come today, not because of residues, we're actually going to come because you don't have to wash your hands. And hopefully, I wish it was otherwise, but that's the reason. We can add proteins and fine phenolics and get structure as they wanted. But we could do that with an external protein column. And we wouldn't have a sediment. And we wouldn't need to change about the change the tank. We wouldn't need to do a filtration. And we wouldn't have a residue. Okay. So we could add things that stop the craft of the country pistols growing. If you were to look at uh, Codex Elementaire, it's the most embarrassing list of stupid things you could add to wine in the history of the world. If you're a Kanoa leap cadet, if you think that Elementaire is good, um, I'll suggest we don't sit down and have a talk about what's in wine and why you're putting it there. So you could add gum Arabic and it would stop the Christmas growing. But you and I would say, well, why don't you tell me that you added the gum Arabic? No, I don't have to. Okay, so like a number of approved, generally considered safe, but I'm not going to tell it so. Okay, why do I say that transparency? No, sorry. Um, we can dump in nanoproteins, we can dump in melting lights for us, but we'd be much better off to have very specific agents, external, able to be treated <coughs> in the same tank, without the same transfer, without using all the small, and not having a residue. So it's a collision of the non residue approach with the water savings. <laughs> Yeah, we could go through other examples. You see that was 40 people. So, one of the, if we were in a winemaker's audience, and I won't embarrass the winemaker's audience by asking him to raise a hand. The usual question I have for people is how many times is the wine transferred in this lifetime? And for some cases it's six, sometimes it's eight, I've even heard 12. I want you to understand every time it's transferred, it's a tank washing. I'll ask you the question, why on earth did you transfer the wine? It'd be a pretty good reason, but simply because you did something to make it taste better or be stable for a marketplace doesn't qualify. Okay? And so if we don't understand the number of tank transfers is equal to the biggest denominating factor in our water usage, we're not going to be able to save water very much, we're just going to say, well, I don't wash as much water, don't use as much water as I wash the tank when I do the transfer. Wrong answer. Changing the number of tank transfers is um, And it used to be that you won't worry about picking up microbes in the next tank or having oxidation pick up in the movement, or you might have some leaves lost in wine. It's actually none of those. It's you won't have the water to wash the tank. So when can you change your practices to do so? And here's some quick examples. 
some of you, yeah. maybe one or two, in the have been in classes that I've taught elsewhere that will call it a longer period of time. But we've talked about these technologies which are out of tank treatments, and um, they're all aimed at not having tank transfers or not going into a tank and then within a matter of a day moving it into another tank. Now, a lot of companies here, a lot of groups are doing flotation, but you're still not doing what I'm talking about. So, the Jamison cell is a way to do an inline, very rapid flotation system, far better than current conventional systems, that would let you go directly by juice from press straight to fermentation. Uh, you wouldn't go and settle and rack, and you wouldn't use a centrifuge and go tank tank, you would go clay flat straight. You would save you a tank washer. If we had a protein macro pack column, we wouldn't do it in my fine, it would save you a tank washing. If you had a fluidized crystallized mm -hmm. the tartrate outside mm -hmm. the, to the tank, you would save the tank washing and you would be stable. See and if you had several different tanks that the components you wanted to blend together and they're different sizes, you could actually make them make them all of them and put them back into the same tank and they will be the same without a tank transfer. Okay? That slide is 35 years old. This pet. So, and that pet. So, one of the accountabilities or one of the planning processes for the go through the wine making practices in a company and work out the reds and whites and virtual wines. What is the historical pattern of treatment? What is the consumption number of uh, transfers, number of washers? Um, and what's the target? And the continuous improvement is you keep on changing the target as you can, but if you don't have a target, you're not going to be able to improve. If you don't have a quantitative metric, you won't be able to improve. I'm not talking philosophically and psychologically, I'm talking mathematically in business and in physics. And so you need a footprint to talk about that improvement. And those examples are all possible, they're available. The question is when are they going to be adopted? And so think of these treatments in two regards, actually. From a winemaker's perspective, you might only be treating part of a tank volume instead of all of it. Did you catch that? So instead of doing bentonite fining on 1,000 litres, you actually might do a macro pet treatment on 200 of that 1,000, still make it stable, which one you have to treat 200. Don't talk about time, don't talk about efficiency, don't talk about tech transfer and washing. I'm just talking about minimal treatment of the winemaking to achieve the same objective. So each of these is a treatment in a tank, and the question is, what's in the red box? Why aren't those red boxes available commercially? As part of the search gap, that's part of the commercialization gap. If you wanted to spend your money, you would spend your money getting technologies to build those things because that's what's holding you up from doing intense with those reduced water to the central you do transfers like wash tanks. If we were to clean, we'd like to get rid of conventional cleaning. I realize we've got an industry in a country where dairy is prominent and there is a lot of vested interest in understanding of knowledge and understanding the stem and the dairy world. Because yeah. just has got some pretty serious uh, blinkers. And if we use the dairy industry cleaning chemistries as the basis of wine cleaning chemistry, we're probably making a bit of a mistake. So the alternatives would be we don't want downstream sodium. We don't want muscle plastics. We don't want chlorine dioxide. We don't want BOD, biological oxygen demand. We don't want COD. We don't want to put things into tank cleaning that are going to cause a problem downstairs. We actually understand the chemistry of what that is, so the answer is don't do that. And that's the alternative. The other factor of cleaning a tank now is we want to use chemistries that make it really easy. But when we've washed the tank, we could clarify the corresponding solution and use it a second time. And do that one a third time, and take that one a fourth time. Because now we want to use the water many times. It's not useless. After we've washed the tank, it's actually 90% of the potential for the next one. But if we're used to only using water once, we'll use a lot of water. We'll need a lot of water and we'll generate a lot of waste water. If you want to address that issue, if you want to address that issue, maybe you address this issue. And that's what we'll talk about here. So um, I'll take it, I don't want to make you really sick, but I'll take the extreme case, which is E. coli. Okay, we don't have E. coli in wine. So understand that everything I'm talking about is less than the E. coli case. But if you were worried about E. coli and you wanted to 
reduce a thousand of them to a hundred, we would call that one decade reduction, a factor of ten. And if we reduce the hundred down to ten, we call it a two decade reduction. And if I went through down to one bug out of a thousand, it would be three decade reduction. And so if I wanted to sell at a hundred thousand E. coli and kill them to the point that there's only one left, that's all back to the mathematical order of five decade reduction. Okay. Most people, I think, in the dairy are going to five decade cleaning. And we don't have E. coli. So what I'm talking about is extreme. If we just did hot water, this is time in seconds. And the most important points for you are this is the seconds, so 60 seconds is a minute. We get ahead to 1200 is uh, 20 minutes. 20 minutes is common cycle time for cleaning equipment. And so try to think what you can get done in 20 minutes. This is the decade reduction, one decade through five. And this is a function of water, neutral water, duly due to temperature. So if I had 50 degree temperature for 20 minutes, <coughs> Not quite, it's actually about 30 in the case of water by itself. I don't think most of you would recognize that you could have killed virtually every E. coli on a plate if you just had 50 degree water in your dishwasher. Or if you let it sit in the sink for 20 minutes. You've been told that you'll need a detergent with a clean chemistry and you'll need hot water. And the answer is you can do it in hot water and you can do it in 10 seconds. That's why when in fact you're going to spend 20. So instead of this kind of approach of ozone of killing five decades in five seconds and having a dangerous material and something you don't really want to make, why wouldn't you just say, it's going to take 20 minutes and that's all I need? And that's intelligent engineering of a cleaning system that requires fussless energy. So this could be, um, in this example, warm water, not really even hot water, uh, given 20 minutes and I haven't even talked about a chemistry added in to do it cheap. If you go to now 2.3 pH, 20 degrees C, ambient, um, this is lemon juice, this is Coca-Cola, Pepsi, okay, this is going to steam you off your cup, but it's not going to burn through your skin. Um, there's a whole range of bugs, including E. coli, as pathogens, and virtually all of them will be killed almost within 20 minutes, certainly within 30 minutes, at ambient temperature. Ambient temperature. If you had had a low pH with 1% peroxide, if you went to the store today to buy a 3% solution of peroxide in the pharmacy, that's three times more concentrated than I'm talking about. So this is the loop. When it decomposes, it's going to be water and oxygen. That's what I'm talking about. There is no residue downstream in cleaning that you'd have done five decades and you did it at ambient temperature while you were asleep. And there's no hazard in the workplace. I'll go on and on. The point is, if I had done that in a solution which was water and I used 100 volumes, if I was to actually wash the tanks and capture the solution and filter 90% of that for the next tank, I only have to actually put 10 more in instead of 100. And if I go on and on and on and on, this is the volume of the original honey that's still in use after 10 cycles. So after 10 cycles, a third of the water I started with is still in the use for the next tank. But every subsequent cleaning is just tens, not hundreds. But I'm just the example of going to 10. I'm back to the point where um, I'm using, uh, eight, um, I've saved 810 litres out of what would have been a thousand. Okay? So I'm using a fifth of the water. And I'm using it more efficiently, but I've actually killed more bugs, and I didn't use chemistry, but I had to have a capture system and a filtration system in my cleaning solutions. Carbon emissions. Uh, you're probably familiar with the definitions of scope one, two, and three. Scope one is the stuff that it's in your backyard and you might want to take care of it. Um, scope two and three is the stuff you get from other people. Point the finger. Sorry, that was a that was a cynics definition of a sustainability classification. Um, so it's called take care of your own business. And in a world of winemaking, the greatest impact on the environment 
of the richest release source of concentrated carbon dioxide in the world is called the wine fermenter. So I don't understand why we don't capture it. Doesn't matter. The point is, we should be capturing that in a winery so that the winery becomes zero carbon in scope one. I'll wait for the questions. I'll wait for the questions. The point is that typically the emissions of CO2 we think of as industrial, um, power supplies, uh, stations, cars, jets, trains, they're all moving. The exhaust is all hot. Uh, it's 20% CO2, not 100% CO2. Um, and it's often up in the air, not on the ground. The wine fermenter is on the ground, it's stationary, it's at ambient temperature, and it's pure CO2. It's five times more concentrated than it's stuff that everyone's worried about. Where is the problem? But in some world of the sustainability spectrum, people have said you don't have to do anything because the vine's going to take it up next year. So I don't have to do anything because either my vines or someone else's vines, often someone else's vines, is going to take it up for me, so I don't have to do a own thing. I think you'd agree that's not adequate anymore. And if you speak to younger people, that's not acceptable. So it really is this emission, and we should be monitoring and capturing it so it is an emission. And then we can talk about having zero carbon wineries in the true sense. Um, and we're not going to assume someone else's offsets just because we can. Yeah. A quick summary of things. So we could go on and talk about how many litres of CO2 per <coughs> juice. A litre of juice is going to generate 60 litres of pure CO2. Okay, we build wineries out in the open air. What do we do now? Because the CO2 would be hazardous otherwise. Some people do fermentations inside buildings and it becomes hazardous. And then we do things to get rid of the CO2 in the building because it's hazardous. But if we trapped it, we wouldn't have had the acid environment. If we had trapped it, we could have the other side. And if we trapped it, it wouldn't have been an emission and it would have been zero carbon. So why aren't we trapping it? So forget the 60 litres, just go straight to a bottle. So 80 grams of CO2 in a bottle of wine like we had last night. Um, compared with 65, which would be typically in that used by the electricity we purchased from the coal plants in the United States, I'm not sure I that. But this is clearly this is bigger than what people are talking about as energy and solar and savings. It's bigger. It's an elephant. Okay? And in the case of a new bottle, put that into context and we can talk about why we use bottles another time. I'll just focus on this one. Why are we releasing the 80 grams per bottle when we can do something about it? And if you want it to be serious, if you want it to be a leader, if you want it to be known as a leader in sustainability, I'll suggest to you, you have the option to be so. A long time ago, more than uh, this particular case, I'll go back to the years, was a proposal to capture CO2, sequester it on the site, but not using lots of energy, and not using lots of complicated equipment, and not using something that takes lots of training programs and certification, and that is to actually convert CO2 into chalk. So, could you build a system which makes CO2 very soluble, 50 times more soluble than it is before? <coughs> so it's easy to get a lot of gas in the liquid quickly. Have it so insoluble that when it's dissolved, it's actually <coughs> going to precipitate, and now you can capture it, they can get chalk, and they can be kind of light. Little diagram, we can talk about that details later, but there's nothing new. The question is when we're going to look like. I want to give an example of transparency, and this is not because Patrick's in the audience, this is because I've met people from Beno 20 years ago, and they, in their annual reports, provide this tabulation of footprints for water, energy, carbon, blah, 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 blah. They express it in per litre, it's a footprint, and they express it in per litre of alcohol on a footprint, because they're in the states, because it's also my business. Here's their numbers. For 2009, this is a 2010 report. They've been doing it since 2006, and they qualify for the Global Reporting Initiative that was already established in footprints. So, if you want to understand how to do accountability and display publicly transparency, I think it's a good example. 
So again, the things I talked about are engineering problems. There's almost no R&D on research of these things. Um, in the country I come from, the research is funded by the politics of certain companies, not the things that you and I would think about. So these aren't likely to get done in that environment. But you have this opportunity as a small country and a focused one. And is there some aspect of one of those projects that you could pick on? The answer is yes. So I want to quickly skip over things now. Um, I had a chance, so we had a chance um, a few years ago to build a winery at school, which was a teaching research winery combination. And it was an opportunity to build the most advanced facility and incorporate these ideas. So let's go look at it, and I'll skip it in terms of time. So this is the winery itself. Uh, I'll show you some pictures in there. But essentially, it generates energy from solar, stores some of that solar in lithium batteries, has the option to have a flue cell, which is running on hydrogen, captures rainwater off the buildings adjacent to it in one of the driest parts of California, stores it in a series of tanks and filters it to our own level, brings that water into clean tanks, and every time we clean the tank, we capture the water, refilter it, reuse it. So this is the 10 times thing I was talking about before. We uh, built to capture, but we have not yet sequestered, but we will sequester CO2. We have a cooling water system is a solar powered compressor that actually makes ice cubes that we trickle water over to make cold water. We can bank 10 tons of ice cubes so that we don't use electricity in the daytime. <coughs> Hot water is passive solar and it can be supplemented with fuel cell or electricity if we need to. But the cleaning chemistries we're using are ambient, so we don't need hot water. I don't do cold stabilization, so we don't need cold stab. And if you went to Google, sorry, those of you that are online checking, go to Google, go to Maps, put in Robert Mondavi Winery, and zoom down, and this is what you'll see. A winery that's fully off the grid today was built. A facility which runs two water systems, one from this roof, which hits the ground, comes back in here, and is the toilet water flushing for the entire building. So the building water use is off the grid, on-site capture. And the adjacent building, which is the institute itself, that water is kept in the water here. And this water, in what we call the Jackson building, is filtered to the same degree. And it's the water, which is the arrow we're going to use to clean in the winery, take it back to recover it, take it back to clean, and take it back to recover it. This building was the first leaf platinum building that was a winery in the United States, the highest scoring platinum building ever built at a university and a building which exceeded all standards even today. But that's a combination of things. This is now covered in solar. The lithium banks are at the back here. Um, is progressing towards a completely independent, self-sustainable, incredibly efficient example of a winery. I hope you'll come and see it sometime. I'll skip over some of these in terms of time. So let me go straight to the end. I want, to appreciate, I want to acknowledge the appreciation of the organising committee who pulled my name out of the hat for some um, And thank you for that uh, It's a pleasure and it's something I'll suspend you. Um, I have an endowment which funds the work I do. It's in the name of a friend, a son of a friend, and um, it's the Stephen Scott endowment. That let me do the kind of things which other people don't want me to do. They're called mischief. Um, I work at the University of California. And I just showed you the most exceptional building in the entire university systems of the United States. And it was privately funded by a list of people, which if I put them on, would be another three slides. But central in them is Robert Mondavi, the Jackson family, Jerry Law, and a number of other people. And these people, at the middle of the meltdown, the economic crisis, provided the funding for a privately funded building, which was the most exceptional building of its kind in the world. So I'm lucky to be at UC Davis, and I'm lucky to be surrounded by exceptional people. And I'm lucky to have good students, and I'm lucky to have good colleagues and friends. Thank you for your attention.
it felt like a glimpse of the future, didn't it? And um, if we could just possibly kidnap Roger at the border, keep him here, I think um, failing that, which is probably a legal scenario, I would imagine, um, we just have to continue to read his research and become inspired. But not only inspired, translate that practically. That's where our future lies and leadership lies. So thank you very much, Roger. Um, onwards now. I'd love to see Jonathan Hamlet on the stage. So um, Jonathan is obviously well known to many of us here in New Zealand, but for those of you who have not come across um, Jonathan before, he is um, the Hicks Bay Regional Viticulturist for Villa Maria Group. But most of us have encountered Jonathan um, at the various organic um, fora, which he is instrumental in organising as chair of um, organic wine growers. Um, and he is going to speak to us today on approaching purity the organic way. Thank you, Emma, and uh, thank you for the invitation to this uh, great event. Uh, always a little intimidating being a Hawke's Bay red grower in certain long confidence uh, and talking about organics. But here we go. Quite a bit to get through, just a quick 10 minute slot. So just want to cover where New Zealand Organics um, in our wine industry presently is at. Uh, really, how does this compare globally? Like, how are we doing in, in a bigger, bigger context? What are our consumers up to? And then just a, a, a small area, kind of the nitty gritty in terms of challenges that we face, uh, both viticulturally and wine making. So we presently have uh, just over 1,700 hectares of certified organic um, production in New Zealand, which is only 4.5% of New Zealand's total vineyard area. And uh, that has been in a relatively steady state, but what we've probably seen is that area has increased, but due to kind of 18 to 20% vineyard area increases over time in the last 10 years, it hasn't grown at such a great rate. But what is very positive is actually the number of wineries involved. And really this is the biggest change that we've seen in the last 10 years, whereas it really started in New Zealand as small artesian producers interested philosophically in growing this way. But now we see most of New Zealand's large mainly wineries um, producing grapes organically and some organic wines. So uh, that's a very positive thing. And probably in summary, on a whole, a lot of the conversion to organics in New Zealand has actually largely been driven by viticulture. In terms of our individual regions, actually Central Otago has 16% of their vineyard area in organics, uh, Nelson 8%, North Canterbury and 7%, and the Wairarapa and 7%, so they are at actually higher levels. In terms of our wine production, uh, we presently export about $46 million uh, worth of organic wine and sell about between just under $30 million uh, domestically. But probably more importantly, there's actually a large volume of organic grapes that doesn't make it to certified organic wine. Uh, and this uh, value of volume is actually quite hard to capture. Um, and some of this has actually been purchased in regard to quality levels, not just for organic status. So what's the rest of the world now doing? I remember uh, standing in a conference 10 years ago and New Zealand's organic area was actually up with some of the best in the world. And the truth is, that's not the same today. So um, there's actually over 300,000 uh, hectares of organic grape production in the world and it's hard to get the stats but that also includes uh, table grape production uh, which averages out almost the same in New Zealand at 4.7 percent. Really the biggest factor is the EU. This is where the largest growth has been and is over 70 percent in New Zealand's uh, of the world's organic uh, grape production. In terms of percentages, um, Spain is actually leading the way in terms of sheer volume, but really you can probably take the United Kingdom out of their percentages. Uh, and it's basically uh, Austria, <coughs> Spain and France that are the biggest leaders within the EU.
And that growth has really um, strived from 2006 to 2011. And um, really that's where in New Zealand our growth has actually slowed slightly. So in terms of our market and what are some of the opportunities, well, it's actually very, very positive. The global market for organic food and produce is actually growing at quite a strong rate, over 10%. Uh, in New Zealand, it's over 8%, which is actually double the rate of conventional produce. And in the USA, sales of imported organic wines have actually increased by over 12% per annum from 2013 to 16. And organics has also been used as a tool for market access. And probably one of the best examples of that is the Swedish alcohol monopoly. In 2013, they actually announced that by 2020, they wanted 10% of their products to be organic. And they've already achieved that goal. So to the sticky end of our industry is our consumers. And really, at the end of the day, uh, they can be a piggy bunch. We're in a world of conscious values-driven consumers. They know what they want, they expect to be able to get it, and they want to connect with products that reflect their values. They are increasingly seeking sustainable and ethical products, and the rise of fair trade is probably an extremely good example of that. And at the end of the day, they hold the consumer power, and that we need to listen and act in the market. And what will our consumers look like in 20 years? I think Brigato this year was, last year, was an eye in terms of the, the debate over synthetic wine. In 20 years' time, we will have consumers that have always known that choice. How will our products compare to those consumers? <coughs> And really, what shapes their perception? We've already heard talk today, and I think um, Steve led into it quite well. The rise in debate in the media and to our consumers over how we produce our grapes is of vast interest to us. And I'd be the first to say that um, the way that we grow grapes today will not be found acceptable in the future, and we have to adapt to that rather rapidly. And regardless of how valid some of the details are around those arguments, it is the consumer <coughs> perception that is key, not always the reality. So in the past we've actually seen um, a very big motivation for conversion from the people actually working the land. And it's really been around that respect for the land, that the nature can reflect these sites in a more authentic way, and that Really, as a farmer, you need to think outside the square and keep advancing. And I think you've had a lot of talk so far in this conference about the idea of the concept of TOR and really nailing down to the specifics of what Sydney and Blanc can offer to the consumer. And really, I would argue and I would implore that part of our kind of process of growing and making the wine at the moment it actually dulls that ability to be able to do that. So all originally kind of it was seen as very much a fringe management, but now we're undertaking it on much larger scales and with great success. So what are our challenges? Well, originally in viticulture, and it was very much viticulture focused, a lot of growers freaked out at the concept of not being able to use herbicide and change that to non-chemical management. Really, with the uh, increase in available machinery and techniques, and to be honest, I'd actually just say experience. 10, 20 years ago, we had very little experience with the equipment and the techniques involved with organic undermine management. I think we're far more advanced now, far more confident in doing it far more successfully. So, we can bust that myth. Cost of production is another one. We definitely see that the cost of production in organics and the conversion process can be higher, uh, but we find that it's often limited to the conversion process. And that some of the increases in the cost of production in the vineyard in terms of undermine management are actually offset by savings in chemicals and other operations. So one of the sticking points, especially for Marlborough Sydney and Blanc, is actually yield. But with some research done this year um, by Bart Arnst, he actually found that 
over a large range of organic Sauvignon Blanc producers, they were averaging uh, about 13 tonne per hectare. At the same time, they were actually receiving approximately $300 more per tonne in grape prices for the, what they were producing. But I think in my experience in terms of Sauvignon Blanc and organic production, the consistency of yield is what we're most challenged with. And that's, I think, something that we're still learning and um, really fine-tuning our ability to make that uh, much improved. But if the reality is uh, our growing system has to change, those cost of productions might just be a given for everybody. Winemaking also comes with its challenges. Uh, one of the biggest challenges is different organic standards for different markets. Uh, these create a lot of complexity in the winery. Um, we've got some kind of distinct examples with some uh, countries having different sulphite addition uh, restrictions, uh, copper. Uh, also, the use of obviously post-ferment uh, great concentration for sugar balance would need to be organic. And really, a lot of these actually have quite a significant impact on producing the style of marvellous Sauvignon Blanc we presently make. But there are those that are doing it very, very well, and not just on a small scale, so it is possible. So what are our opportunities? Well, at the end of the day, we really want to look after our most valuable assets, <coughs> our land, and we want that to be producing exciting wines for a long future ahead of us. We really want to produce fruit with great resilience and quality. And uh, it was interesting to hear Steve talking about the effects of uh, herbicide on detritus because there's actually some very exciting research in New Zealand uh, recently uh, that has shown that uh, a very big correlation between uh, lack of detritus and ground cover environment. So watch that space. We want to produce wines that truly reflect our terroir. And at the end of the day, we want to look after ourselves. We want staff to be working in a happy and safe environment. We need to plan for the future now. And uh, at the end of the day, we're really, realistically, Marlborough is coming into a long series of redevelopment. We know we have a history of grapevine trunk disease, of virus, and other issues in our vineyard. And we have 30 to 40 years of vineyard planting ahead of us. So we need to plan for the future. We need to make these vineyards set up in the right designs to produce wine organically. And this comes down to things like very drip line to not grow weeds in the first place. It comes down to having the right vine densities to have consistent yields. It's not, not too difficult. We need to protect and strengthen our New Zealand, the New Zealand brand. We need to champion our unique environment. And at the end of the day, organics is profoundly simple. It is a de definable concept. In its simplest terms, it means growing without synthetic products. We need to focus on quality and value over volume. I'm sure that's going to be thrashed out in the days to come. And we need to meet the market. So great wine is in our nature, and um, I'd definitely like to uh, do a little small plug that we do have our Organic Wine Growers and Biodynamics Conference on the 25th and 27th of June back in here. So in terms of uh, being able to come along and actually thrash out some of the details in a, in a lot more rigorous way, come along. But New Zealand Saint Blanc is something that's very unique, unique and extremely special and it's put us in such an enviable, enviable position in the global market. And let's not stand still, let's be proactive and make decisions for our industry in the long term. Thank you.